I'm always uh, supporting any kind of conference where we have to talk about this crucial issue of women in Islam and our society within our societies and within our communities and I will come to the, to the topic straight away but I cannot start today without mentioning that of course they were expecting so many people here and, and many are not here because they may be involved in the demonstration uh, for Palestine. So I want to start with this, uh, in the name of justice, as it was mentioned, but also in the name of dignity. And there are principles that are undisputable when it comes to human dignity. So whatever is your take in any political dimension, here we are, and uh, supporting, and we must, I think, Muslims and non-Muslims, in the name of human dignity, in the name of justice, to support uh, the Palestinians in Gaza, in the West Bank, and everywhere. So my heart is there, even though my body is with you, uh, and my mind is with you, bringing you towards that, them. To say, yes, I agree and I said it many times, to kill innocent people is wrong. But you cannot just take a stand today by putting Palestinians and Israeli government today at the same level. The principle is clear. They are oppressors and they are oppressed. The state of Israel is the oppressor and Palestinians are the oppressed. So the resistance is legitimate and we have to resist in our way. We are not supporting violence, but if we are silent, we are promoting the violence. So let us speak out, say the truth, say that we are supporting the Palestinians, that we are supporting human dignity, and we are not supporting them because they are Muslims. By the way, they are not only Muslims. We are supporting them because they are oppressed and they are human beings. We are supporting and protecting human dignity. So I want to start with this, telling you as well that we launch a global movement of nonviolent resistance against the extremist and violent policy of the State of Israel. And go on internet, on my website, on others, you will have this appeal with seven principles that are indisputable. And they are crossing the border, not only Islamic, they are universal. And do you, your job, speak out, do something. And even if you speak about women, it's also the time to speak about this because there is no difference. Women there are resisting, they are killed. It's a human uh, struggle. And I think that we have to say something. We don't only have to say something out of emotion, it's an ongoing struggle. So it's today, it's tomorrow, and after the ceasefire, we have to continue in the name of justice because it's a local crisis but has global impact. So it's our duty. So really, Muslims and non-Muslims, this is what we have to do, and I'm very happy to see some of the Jewish British citizens who are much more courageous than some of our Muslim brothers and sisters. It's just a shame not to be able to say something because we are scared. Sarah Yosef was speaking about confidence. This is the starting point. If you are for justice, you are confident. If you are for money, you may be scared. Okay, let me start with the topic and as I took the, the minutes you gave me to say something about this, so I will stick and try to stick to the 45 minutes that you gave me. Uh, uh, I think that uh, the question of women, when it comes to this, let me start with an introduction and to highlight three main points. The first point is really to say something about, when it comes to speak about women, of course, at his, uh, as it was said, and I think it's important to speak about history, to speak about uh, the evolution, the historical evolution, understanding from the first scholars, uh, what happened, in which way the women were involved, and in which way we lost this memory. 
and we lost even the stance that some women had in the Islamic history. At the same point, we have to be very cautious not to idealize the past, to uh, think about something which was so great in the past, and not to understand that it's an ongoing struggle, it's not easy, and some points were uh, to be made by, by women throughout the Islamic history as well. But when we speak about the question of women, we have to focus on three main fields. The first one is, before even speaking about rights and duties, and this is the problem that we have, the struggle for uh, 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 justice and, and evolution and reform from an Islamic viewpoint is not only about my rights and my duties, it's deeper than that. It's about the status first. It's a field, and I will come to this. The second is uh, speaking about liberation, and I will speak about the concept of liberation is, is central. And, and I, allocate, I allocated in the, the new book one chapter out of this whole process of speaking about Islamic ethics and applied Islamic ethics on women. And the subtitle is Islamic ethics and liberation. And liberation is very much connected to anything which has to do with human beings, but also women, and I also wanted to come to this. And the third word, which is essential, is empowerment. As you had it in your uh, presentation, your introduction to the day, to this seminar, I think that three main words, status, liberation, and empowerment, in which we have to deal with this, this is something which is quite important. With these three different fields, what is needed now is not only to speak about the fields and to come with, okay, this is what we have to do, the, uh, we should do this, we should do that. Before, upstream from the whole discussion, it's important also to have a vision. What do we want to achieve? And this is why the status is very important. When you speak about the status of women, you understand that there is an achievement there. There are objectives that we want to reach. So through the objectives, we get the vision, and objectives and vision will help us to uh, decide the steps that we have to follow because there are steps. We cannot get everything uh, in one go. We have to think about this vision, the objectives that we want to achieve, and what are the steps that we have to follow. So it's a strategy. It's a struggle. It's a strategy. It's based on something which is important. And this is the third point that I want to, to make here. What do we want to achieve? Why am I here? Why am I coming to one conference speaking about women in Islam? Is it only to speak about empowerment, liberation, and the status of women? What is the deep achievement? What do I want to achieve, really? It's in fact for a believer coming from within an Islamic, uh, uh, Islamic references and from uh, a universe of reference. The, the main point, which has to be very clear, what I want to achieve is faithfulness. I want to be faithful. Faithful to a message that I understand it's a universal message. It's for all the people. It's not only for us. It's a message where you find principles that are universal. It doesn't mean that we want all the people to be Muslims. But our Islamic principles should be understood by all the people. This is the universality of our message. The universality of our message is the, the fact that our principles are ours. It doesn't mean that we are the only one to be able to understand them. So the point here is we want to remain faithful to the Islamic message as Muslims. And at the same time, to be understood by the people around us because, in fact, this is the mercy of diversity, which is, you understand who I am, even though you are not like, or such, or like me, or, or you are not sharing with me my principles. This is, You are but a mercy for the world. If you are a mercy for the world, it's not for all the people to be like you. No, the mercy is not. I'm a mercy the very moment you become like me. No. I'm a mercy because you are who you are and who I am. But from where I am, you can understand what I stand for. And I can understand who you are. So my message is open to you and it's not asking you to become like me. Because at the end of the day, it's not in my head. It's in your heart. It's the relationship you have with God. It's not me. I don't have, have no power on your heart. But I can be a witness of your mind. For your mind, I am a witness, and the witness is just 
let us try to be faithful to our message. This is a very important point here because the problem I have with some of the, uh, the Muslims who sometimes are presented as uh, moderate Muslims, exactly the same problem that I can have with some Muslims are saying, I am representing the true Islam. In fact, that they are not mainly concerned with being faithful. They are adapting their stand to who is listening to them. Or they can be for the others, with the others, say, I'm a moderate Muslim, that the point is, look how open I am. Once again, it's a lack of confidence. And the lack of confidence is exactly the opposite. People saying, I'm not like you, Islam is not the West, so I'm defining myself against. Which once again is a lack of confidence. So, to reduce Islam to something which is, Islam is not, is a lack of confidence. Or, Islam is so open that Islam is nothing special. So, open to everything with no rules, no limits, no principles, moderation, delusion, nothing. So here, faithfulness is a very important point. And the problem that I have today, when it comes to issue of Muslim women is that the Muslims and our communities in the name of Islam are indulging into discriminations, superficial understandings, betrayal and not faithfulness of the Islamic message. So this is why I think that we have to go through a radical reform, not of Islam. Islam has not to be reformed. Our interpretation has to. So many people who are not reading what I'm trying to say, just they heard someone saying that I said something I never even thought about, are saying, oh, he wants to reform Islam. No, I want to reform the Muslim understanding of Islam, their interpretations. The Quran is the Quran is not going to change. The prophetic traditions are the prophetic traditions that are not going to change. But we are changing, our minds are changing, we have to reinterpret the text according to that context. Why? Because if history is evolving, is, if geography is based on diversity, so there is no way to remain faithful but to evolve. No faithfulness without evolution. In our understanding, not in the text. Because the same text read in a new environment, you need to have a, a, a better understanding, a new understanding of the text to be faithful to the meaning of the text in the new environment. So this is something which is also an essential point. And it means that, and especially in that field, no faithfulness without marrying two dimensions. Deep faith, because we try to be faithful, and critical mind. Critical mind meaning trying to understand the text in the light of the context, in the light of the environment, in the light of my society, to remain faithful to the principle. And if I'm a practicing Muslim, and I want to be faithful to the text because this is, at the end, what I want to achieve. This deep faith is to read the text in the light of these spiritual teachings that are coming with the text. And sometimes some of our fellow citizens in the West, they don't understand that. It's as if they want us to evolve, but they, 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 they forget that we are believing, that we believe that the text, the scriptural source, the Quran, the prophetic traditions are texts that we are respecting, that we think that this is coming from God. So we also have sometimes very simple things. Even some, you know, sometimes I am in, 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 in interviews and talking to people, I forget just to remind the people of very simple things. So they want us to be rational, reasonable, with no references. And you just have to say, yes, I'm trying to be rational, I am reasonable, but don't forget. I believe that these texts are coming from God. So let us start with this because it's an important point. Having said that, let me start with uh, uh, an assessment. And especially in the, 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 the uh, upstream from everything which has to do with women, and I will come to some of the points that we have to, to address. For years, I have been involved with FEPR, low Islamic law and jurisprudence, trying to say, yes, Islam is not uh, against women, but Muslims have uh, uh, 
clearly a problem in the way we are dealing with this issue. And I'm thinking that what we have to do is to come to this Islamic law and jurisprudence and to adapt and to think of new legal opinions. And I think that still we have to do that. But at the end, you understand that if you come to the tradition, this long history, you understand that the, in the way we try to find solutions, there is already a problem. Why? Because the Muslim scholars, the first Muslim scholars, they were producing fiqh, Islamic law and jurisprudence. And mainly they were, after the first generation of the, 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 the Muslims in the Companion, even uh, during the Salafi period, they were mainly, uh, mainly men doing that. The great majority of them. When you are a man and you think about what is right and what is wrong, the limits of behavior, and you are a man, the third, by definition, is speaking about what? Limits and functions. By definition. So if you come back to this, you will reduce the discussion about women on something which is rules, functions, and limits. By definition. And as you are not a woman, if you are a man, thinking about the limits, you cannot put yourself in the status of woman. You think about the duties and the rights. And this is why, by definition, the fifth is directing our attention towards something which is el halal wal haram, the lawful and the unlawful, and the rights and the duties. And from where you are, and then you think about the rules and the functions of women in a society, and then you add to this, and halal wal haram, what is right and what is wrong. So it's all about rules and limits, and then functions, what you have to do and what you cannot do. But there is something which is missing here. By definition, you speak about interpersonal relationships. But what about the human being, per se? The only one who can speak about this, saying the text is not coming first to tell me how I have to act with you, how I have to be with him, which is God, who is God, in which way I have to be with God, this is the central point. Then comes the relationship with others. If you reverse the picture, you speak about the, you are putting rules and limits and functions. So here you are directed towards uh, a dimension which is interpersonal relationships and the way you read the texts is going to be influenced by that. So the whole direction is in which way we are going to organize, set the rules of our social relationships within the family first. So the definition is you are first a wife or a daughter and a mother. But it's coming from where? It's not coming from people very insincere scholars. It's normal. They were just doing their job. They were men. They are trying to find the rules, and they are think, thinking about, okay, the rules, they were very sincere, but having a projection of the reality which was normal from where they, are, they were. And we have to think about this. We cannot reduce the Islamic message to rules, norms, halal and haram. Because at the beginning, it's not about what you cannot do, but what you should be. This is Islam. Islam is, who are you before what I can do and I cannot do. Who are you is the first question. Who are you? Are you a believer? Are you faithful? Are you trying to achieve what uh, the Creator is expecting from you? And this is a very important point. So when it comes to this, you understand that uh, we have a problem upstream from the third dimension. Second point, which is also important here, is uh, that from there, from here, instead of just thinking as Muslims living in the West or in our contemporary, because by the way, it's, a, it's, it's not a Western issue, it's an international global issue, I'm speaking of Muslim women in Muslim majority countries as well as in the West. And not only as Muslim women or Muslim men and women having problems with the issue and looking at the West having solved the problem. Never, never start this discussion like this because some of our fellow citizens and intellectuals are looking at Muslims and say, 
it's as if they don't have a problem. You speak about violence, for example, or domestic violence, it's as if it's a Muslim issue. And the figures are clear, it's not a Muslim issue. Uh, you have much more violence with you know, the traditional families and, and, and white, white families than in other societies. It's just uh, the, problem is that the problems are connected. We all are dealing with the issues that are related to discriminations, violence, and, and uh, 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 difference of treatments or social treatments. So upstream from this discussion, we have to come to the vision, what we want to, to achieve when it comes to this. And this is why I was speaking first about the status and the liberation process and empowerment. And here, we should start to achieve the three fields. We should start with a discussion on the essence. Human being and woman as human being, the essence of womanhood. It's crucial because you will understand that this will have an impact on everything you are going to say on roots. The second is, with the being, is what we want to achieve, as I said, is the ethics, the applied ethics when it comes to, uh, to women. And this is why my point at that level in the discussion within the Islamic uh, communities in the West and the Muslim majority countries is really to challenge both the ulama, the Muslim scholars, and the communities, saying we have a problem now, a disconnect between what the scholars are saying and what the Muslims are doing or understanding. First, what we need today in the platforms or the councils where we have Muslim scholars, if we want to solve the problem of uh, equality, justice, and freedom, and right Islamic treatment towards women, we need to have much more women Muslim scholars. We need women being scholars, knowing the, the, the scriptures, knowing and reading the source. Why? Because you can say that for, once I heard a scholar saying, 80% of what is in the Quran and the prophetic tradition, that it makes no difference if you are a woman or a man. That's true, but 20% is a lot. There's huge differences. When you read the scriptural sources, it's not the same when you are a woman and when you are a man. You don't read them the same way. So we need Muslim scholars and women being involved in that at, at the highest level. And we need them to be in the councils of Muslim scholars when it comes to dealing with the issue. But we don't only need women as Muslim scholars or Muslim women scholars, we also need in these uh, uh, councils people working within the field in the society. What I call ulama al waqa scholars knowing the environment. Why? Because we should know how it works. You know, it's not only an abstract discussion on text, it has to do with reality. Because discrimination, the, the, the way the people are living in a specific, specific setting, in a specific culture, you should understand how it works to be able to say the liberating process is both a deep knowledge of the text and a very deep knowledge, understanding of how it works, the structure, the social fabric. If you don't know this, how are you going to implement the text? And why the first Muslim scholars, for example, they were very, very confident, why? Why they were able to say things that we are not able? Because they only had more knowledge than us of the text? No. They also had the knowledge of the society. Malik, the first one who was living in Medina and Mecca, he was very comfortable with anything which was coming from the text was. Because this was his society. He knew the society, so he was confident. And he was able to do this. This was a, at his time. It was easier than now. Now we are dealing with very complex societies. So we need people coming from the society, coming from how it works, the subtle discriminative processes that we have in the society, to be able to address this in the light of the text, and for the people of the text to understand how it works. So we need platforms and councils where you, as you know, what we call ordinary Muslims, could come with your knowledge of what is in your society to be able to share this with the Muslim scholars. Because at the end of the day, the Muslim scholars are going to change their mind if you change your sense of responsibility. We have a community of passive people complaining about the fact that the scholars are not doing their job, but the community is not doing his jo its job. 
not just complaining, we are not involved. You have to, to take your share of responsibility in the process. You are responsible and at the end you will have the scholars you deserve. Simple questions or simplistic questions will have simple answers or simplistic answers. But it's up to you. You have deep questions about how we go towards this liberating process. You will get the scholars to have all oh, have to think about this. Simple things, that, but deep things. So it's a, a vision that we need, and we need ulama al nusus wa ulama al waqa, scholars of the text with scholars of the environment. And among the scholars of the text, we need women to be involved in this. So we need women on both. And then it's not women against men, it's men and women in the name of peacefulness, which is completely different. Sometimes when I speak like this, women are very happy, are clapping, ah, yes, say it. And the men say, who is he? <laughs> a modern Muslim, a Swiss Muslim, no, I'm a Muslim. I'm here to be faithful in the name of my religion, and I think that we are not. We are betraying, and especially in that field. And we are treating women in a way which is not right. And women are accepting to be treated something, sometimes like this in a way which is not right the most, the deepest sense of alienation that you can have in, in, in our communities when women are repeating the same discriminative process and thinking that this is Islamic. They are completely alienated if you think so. So the point here is to come with a deep sense of responsibility and say we are the driving force of this radical reform which is needed. Having said that, let me now just uh, uh, speak about this essence, being, and ethics. Ethics, you know, the values, what we want to achieve, the objectives, what was coming from the uh, scholars, which is a maqasid. When you read the Quran and when you read the uh, prophetic tradition, there is something which is quite clear. I mean, this came from, in fact, a series of scholars. From the very beginning, in fact, was there was even uh, Abu Hanifa, you know Abu Hanifa when he said, you know, the money that you have to give, the zakat, you don't have to give, you know, uh, things, you can give money instead of giving, you know, uh, food and things like this. He, he was thinking of what? He, he was thinking uh, something which is an analogy. How could you think through analogy and say, okay, don't give food but give money? Because you think of what? You think of the achievement. You think of the objective. The objective is give. Give something that you possess. So to the objective, you change the means. Understanding that at the end, the means are here to achieve the objectives. You get it? This is a very important point. And you can do this by having three things. First, you understand the objectives. Second, you understand, first, you understand the texts. You understand how you extract from the text the objectives and then you, have you are confident with the means. You know the text, you get the objectives, and you are confident with the means, okay? And you understand something? That the means are as important as the objectives. You cannot use wrong means to get good objectives, or right objectives. The right, the means are in fact per se objectives. So you need right means to get right objectives, and you need for that to know the text, to understand the objectives and to be confident with the means. This is it. So there are this. These were the scholars of the beginning, very confident, doing this. Abu Hanifa had no problem. Because he was knowing the text, understanding the means, getting the objectives, and knowing the field within which he was working. This is what we have to do. When it comes now to the objectives, we extract from the objectives, and, and this is where the Muslim scholars, the fuqaha, the jurists, when they are dealing as men with a society, they try to find, as I told you, the limit and the functions. And say, okay, this is a specific field, but before coming to that field, we have to go upstream to ask, what is the main objective for a woman to be a woman as a human being? And then you come to something which is, in fact, everything in Islam. It's about what? Liberation. But the first liberation is what? The deepest and the most essential liberation is what? Is to liberate yourself from the society? No. It's to liberate yourself from yourself. 
The first liberation is ego. It's to liberate. And never forget that. Because this is the starting point of everything. You speak about freedom, come. Tell me your definition of freedom and then we know where you are. If freedom is to do what you want, that's fine. But I have a question before you tell me what you want. Are you sure that what you want is what you want? Are you sure? Because people are playing your psychology. They can make you think that you want what you want, but they want you to want what exactly they want. <laughs> Don't laugh. It's our life. This is life. This is it. When the people, you know, we speak about being brainwashed in Palestine, for example, why? Because we know the power of the media. The media can change your mind and you think, oh yes, it's obvious. They are equal and I am against the oppressors and the oppressed and they are all the same. I'm against both. So you end up thinking exactly like the people are thinking. You go to the suburbs and some and people say, yes, I am against the system. And you look at them and say, it's strange, you are against the system. They are all dressed the same way. So in fact, the system is using you to think that you are against the system. And at the end, you pay because you are part of the market. The market is colonizing you when you think that you are freeing yourself. So when it comes to women, this is a very important thing. This is why I was speaking about the status, and I was speaking about liberation, and at the objectives that everything in Islam is telling us, you as a human being, you have to liberate yourself on your own self. And through, it's a liberation process. It's to come back to your heart and to ask yourself. And this is why, this is a, a, a missing discourse in Islam when it comes to women. And this is why it's important. You know when the Prophet, peace be upon him, came, upon him, came back to Mecca, he did two things. After 20 years of struggle, the people wanted to kill him, okay? He came back. And I always tell the people, you know, he left Mecca standing up. And he was oppressed. He came back victorious and he was prostrated. Okay, in resistance, I stand up. In victory, he is the one um, to serve it. I'm here to serve justice. He came back and he asked the people, what do you think I'm going to do with you? you think I'm going to kill you? Look at that. And he said, you are free. You are free. You are free. First, social liberation, political liberation. Good. What is the second act you did? Understand that the most important thing was not your freedom now. He went to the Kaaba and he destroyed all the idols. For someone who is coming from a spiritual take, understanding, what does it mean? I said, be careful. The true liberation is not the social liberation. The true liberation is in the Kaaba, these idols. The true freedom is not to do what you want as if you think it's to come back to your heart and to ask yourself, do I want what I want? Am I free? Am, am, am I spiritually free? And this is a process that we have to come back from this, you know, the, the struggle for rights, only for rights to come to, we have to come back to this discussion. We need today, the Muslim women, to come back to the spiritual take, the spiritual teaching and to understand that. And by the way, here you are, mercy for the world. Here you are, mercy for the world. Here in the, the, the society and the consumerist society to come back with this true discussion. Say, so I'm striving for my liberation, my spiritual liberation. I want to be an autonomous being, not only a social actor. I want to be a social actor, but first, my first question is this one. Because my religious message is to be completely free this freedom of my heart, of heart, the freedom of my mind, the true freedom. And this is something which is an essential thing. When you come back to the Quran and you listen, God made you love faith. But you have another verse telling you, the beauty of, you know, the zuyina linnas hope. It means that Allah beautifies the love of superficial things. Sexuality, money, and all this. In fact, the love was beautified. 
The love was beautified. The other verse is not saying this. What was beautified was faith. So to get the beauty, you have to come back to your faith. You have to come back to your heart. And in your heart, you will get the true love. The other one is the love was beautified. In other words, there are two ways to love. A superficial way that you think that what you love is beautiful because it's love. My heart is speaking. Be careful. Sometimes love should be reassessed because you tend to think that you love, but you love apparently, superficially, emotionally. To love spiritually means come back to your heart and ask you the right question. Look at these two verses and you will understand all the Islamic messages here. And for women, this is the deep discussion. And this is the, the but by the way, why am I saying this? It's not only a discussion about women, it's a common discussion. But here we have to come with this very powerful message, which is which kind of liberation do we want to achieve if it's about faithfulness. So this is a liberating process, a spiritual, spiritual five minutes, no, no, ten minutes. This was the starting point. <laughs> and when it comes to this, it has many dimensions. Because it's, it's about what? You'll find in the book a, a new chart of the achievements and the objectives, the ethics, the values that we want to achieve. It's about stability, balance, inner life, well-being, development, inner development. All these this are, these were not in what the scholars were talking about in the past. They were talking about the six, and you will see all the scholars are coming. You know, in Islam you have six principles to protect the deen, one apple, one. You have this from the scholars of the past. The Shah TV came with this by saying what we have to protect is we have to protect our religion, our personal integrity, our minds, our money, our families. That's fine. This was the path. But today we, have, we are in a very complex world. It's much more complex. And in the 14th century, in the time I had this intuition, it's not enough. We need more of these objectives. We need also the objective of the heart. We need to achieve something in our heart. In our society now, with this psychological pressure, this consumer society, we have to come with a very strong discourse. What do you want to achieve as a woman? Where is your freedom? Where is your freedom as a woman in a consumerist society? Don't tell me only about rights, because if you don't want the scholars to speak about rights, don't start the discussion about your rights. Start the discussion with your being. And your being is, here I'm free. Because this is what I want. And all the discussion about the head start is wrong if you only put it as the right and not the right. It's the question of being. If I want to do it, the right is, I should be free to do it. And I should be free not to do it. It's my choice. But if it's my choice, I have to understand the choice is for what? It's a liberating process. It should be a spiritual liberating process if it's understood rightly. Not only, you know, because this is why it's very important. If you come with this discussion, you just say to the men, to the fathers, to the brothers, who give you the right to impose this onto a woman if you don't understand the very meaning of it. And the very meaning of it is it should be done only if it's understood as a liberating spiritual process. And you cannot decide this for the others. You can't decide this. You know this? This is why you come with two strong discourses. The same one, but two strong addresses. You speak to the Muslim saying, it's against this life to impose into a woman to wear it. You cannot do that because you don't understand. You come with rules and it has to be to, to, and it has to do with freedom. Can you decide when I am free? You can't. It's my the spiritual freedom is coming from me, it's not coming from you. And if you decide it, it's by definition against my freedom. So <coughs> remove yourself from my picture and my story. The other way, it's also to say this to our fellow citizens. If it's my freedom, if it's my spiritual freedom, who are you to come with your freedom to impose on to me the only way you think it's right to be free? So it's not freedom. It's imposition in the name of your freedom. So this is something which is a deep discussion here, but this is the starting point of this liberty. And it has to do with everything. It has to do with your being, it has to do with your spiritual endeavor. Any Muslim community which is not giving the means for the man and the woman to go through this process is not respecting the rights of the woman as human being. 
the right of women to be free and to get a sense of femininity. Who am I? Something which is so important. And it comes to everything. It has to do with my autonomy, my personal autonomy. I should be autonomous, spiritually autonomous. It means that I should get the knowledge. You should, I should have the knowledge to be free. So any society which is not providing me with knowledge, it's against who I should be. So you cannot say this. If in the Quran you have as something which is uh, interpersonal relationship, <coughs> they are dressed, they protect you. A woman could be a protection for a man and a man should be a protection for a woman. To be a protection first is to be, to be something, to be free. So give me the means to be who I want to be and who I am to be. So this is something which is so important. It's so important to understand that here we have this discussion. It also has about why the Muslim scholars were, you know, we have things about even sexuality. It has to do also with this. Why in Islam sexuality is not only for procreation. It's not. It has to do with well-being. It has to do with something when the man, you know, with this natural contraception. And by the way, don't start speaking as Muslims as if you were quoting the Christian tradition. Because it's wrong. We don't have the same positions on this. This is wrong. Anyone who's telling you we have the same position is not studying Islam. For two reasons. First, that contraception in Islam is not forbidden. Natural contraception is not forbidden. The prophet was leading the people and knowing what? You know that scholars in the 18th century were saying a man could do the natural uh, uh, contraception by the coit interruptors, as we say, with one condition. He has to ask his wife. Because by doing this, he's not respecting two of her potential rights. The first one is to get uh, a, a child, and the second one is pleasure. Saying that in this relationship, sexuality is not only about a mean to achieve something else. It's in an end per se. This is Islamic. But the Muslims don't know the religion. They don't study. And then about abortion. Yes, the general rule is to say, we are not going to promote it, we are against it. But there is something in Islam which is the fatwa. What is a fatwa? A fatwa is a legal opinion. And what is a legal opinion? It's a specific decision in a specific situation for a specific man or a specific woman to solve a specific problem. Isn't it? You cannot just uh, export a fatwa. It means that in every single situation, when it comes to abortion, you have to study. And you have many, many cases where it's possible. So to sit down and say, we are against everything like this, you don't study. We are just repeating things that are wrong. You have to be very cautious with your words, right? Because it has to do with the being, it has to do with this first dimension. Having said that now, quickly because I have five minutes, but the whole picture for me starts with this. And I think that women, women and men should be involved in this discussion upstream from everything which has to do with rights and, and duties. This is where we have to come together to work on that. And to ask ourselves at the end of the day in which way we can be a driving force for a spiritual liberation. And with this, having this in mind, that the spiritual liberation is the end, the achievement, the goals of everything. You come now to everything which has to do with interpersonal relationships. And here we have two problems. Why? Because we have to deal with texts, scriptural sources. The two main problems that we have are uh, as follows. The first one is what I call...
Okay, Bismillah. Just for those who should know, and this is something which is you can speak and continue when you have the Adhan, and this is the majority of the Muslim scholars saying this. And when someone is saying no, and the way you are saying it, the starting point is respect the diversity of opinions, and not in that way. So I just wanted to show you that the great majority is saying, I'm just going to respect the single view that you are expressing, but you are wrong. No, that's you, it was beyond that. No, no, it's not. It was not you. Take it easy. Okay, quickly. What I was saying is, uh, so when it comes to interpersonal relationships and when we come to the social, the social status here, we are facing two problems. The first one is reduction and the second one is projection. Reduction is the literalist reduction. We have some scholars, and this is not new, this is a diversity that we have, but we have some scholars taking one verse or one hadith, prophetic tradition, and reducing it to the literal understanding, not putting it, we have two problems here. You don't put it in the global message, for example, what the Rebuhunna, you can beat them, so you take this, and it's possible. You don't understand that this was a process of a series of revelations that the, the Quran was revealed through 23 years, and at the end you have to understand the achievement, the, the, the overall objective. So, literal, re, literalist reduction is a problem. And we have some of our, so they call themselves Salafi and they take the word for themselves, we are all trying to follow the Prophet, peace be upon him, and to be in the, the, from the Salaf. Some are literalists and some are more reformists. And this was the, the situation of the companions themselves. So don't let the people say, I'm a Salafi, and they put you outside. We are all trying to be faithful. And from the very beginning, we had people, Abdullah ibn Omar, anhuma, he was very literalist. And Abdullah ibn Mas'ud was thinking of what is beyond what is beyond the text. So the point quickly is here that we have this reduction in the text. The, the second thing is projection, cultural projection. People living in a specific setting, a specific culture, are projecting onto the text things that are not coming from the text, but they are coming from their culture. And this, by definition, is normal. The problem is, for us, you come from Pakistan, you come from Bangladesh, you come from Saudi Arabia, you come from Africa, you come from an understanding of the text which was mixed with an understanding of the cultural context. And you, this was a projection onto the text. You come here and then you don't understand the context and you think the only way to be a good Muslim is to be a Muslim as we were there. So yes, there are some principles that are not changeable. They are immutable. Yes, the way we pray, but there are things that has to be understood in a specific context. Even, for example, when people are telling you the only way to have a headscarf is it's for the headscarf to be black. Why? Because we have, and that's true, by the way, we have a prophetic tradition and reports coming from the companions saying that the companions and the, 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 the prophet's wives were wearing a black hijab. So black is black, don't come and play his words. I say, no, you are confusing with the culture dimension and the way the means with the objective. The objective was covering, but the way you do it, you do it we have to, to, to build this on principles. The principle of modesty, the principle of discretion, the principles even of beauty and the, 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 the principle of the surrounding culture. Yes, I'm finishing. So the point here is cultural projection. And then we have to be critical towards it. So what we need to do here is to come back to the text to extract from the text the principles and to understand these principles in the light of the whole text 
and then also not to be uh, 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 only drive by, uh, by driven by by things that were coming from the cultures of origin. So this process should be done everywhere. And sometimes we have to challenge the cultural understanding, in, even in, in, in Muslim majority countries, by saying, this is not Islamic, this is culture. So sometimes you need to use religion against culture. And especially here, we need that. But this process is a very important one when it comes, from, uh, when it comes to family, for example. It's as if now the only thing that uh, the weak dimension in our community is as if it's women, so we have to be very cautious. The problem we have in, in, in our families is not mainly women. It's not only this. We have a, you know, I had so many discussions with women, and at the end of the day, we have problems of being a man in our community, to be a father in our families. So here we have, we need a discussion which is broader than that, oh, you women do your job at home. And where are the men? What is this discussion about authority, for example? We have a problem with authority. The way we, we deal with authority and the way we understand authority as Muslims. These, these are problems that are crucial here and within society. In mosques, for example, we are very far from the prophetic example in the way he was dealing with mosques, in the way women were involved. His own daughter, his own uh, wife, we were involved in, around the mosque. Now we have mosques where there are only men, and there are no authority, no sharing in the decision or the decision processes. This is completely wrong, and we need to come with, you know, fields where a better understanding. Having said that, and I'm sorry, I had many things to say, but I took too much time at the beginning. But uh, there are things that. We need this new leadership that we are talking about in three things. A new understanding. In the name of faithfulness of the Islamic tradition, what are the priorities, this freedom, liberation process, the social liberation also, and we can also read what was said and, and done by other uh, 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 feminist or femini uh, uh, women groups. It's not, you know, it's not all what they did, it's not us. They were studying processes that we can listen to, we can understand what they were saying, and is this applying or applied in the Islamic majority society? Sometimes yes, it is, and sometimes no. It's not universal, it's how we are sharing experiences. And here we have to come with this. So understanding the discourses, we need now women being able to, to speak with this deep, the broad understanding and this deep uh, understanding of the, 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 the principle. And something which is also very important now is in the media field. Because this image is very important as well. And the image of what, who you are, what you want to be, and in which we want to be, not to come into the media discourse only by saying, you know, uh, Islam is not, or these are my rights, but a very deep philosophical, spiritual, religious discourse on being, being free, struggling, liberating process, assertive, active, contributing. All these are dimensions that should be part of the discourse, and it means that we have to work on, on these three fields in ethics, the inner dimension, the social dimension, and the global dimension as women. Thank you.